Could the Antichrist be an actual Nephilim returned? Stick around and find out. Welcome to the program today. My name is Mondo Gonzalez, and I'm here with Ryan Peterson. Welcome. Mondo, thanks for having me. Great it's to great, here. and you have a new book out uh, called The Final Nephilim, and uh, had a chance to take a look and read it, and I really want to get to the kind of the nitty-gritty, but for some of our audience who might not know, um, kind of talk a little bit, if you will, about your first book and how this is a sequel. Sure. So my first book, Judgment of the Nephilim, the goal behind it was to really go to Scripture and using Scripture make the case for what I call the supernatural interpretation of Genesis 6. The birth of the Nephilim, that it was fallen angels taking human women as wives, giving birth to the Nephilim giants. And why? It all goes back to Genesis 3.15, what I call the ultimate prophecy. This was about the devil's attempt to try and thwart or corrupt the birth of the Messiah, the seed of the woman who was promised in the Garden of Eden. And so judgment of the Nephilim takes us through the war of these two bloodlines and how God time and time again fought to rescue humanity from the brink of extinction uh, and bring us to salvation in Jesus Christ, our Messiah. So, the, so then the title of this book is really the final Nephilim. We kind of asked the question in the beginning. Um, really the goal that you have are working towards is that the Antichrist is this last, the final in a long line of Satan's interference in, in humanity. Um, let's go back for those, again, that might not know. You mentioned Genesis 3.15. Let's kind of take it apart a little bit. What, why, why would we um, think of this coming Antichrist figure as being a Nephilim? What, what's, what's the basis? What's the biblical basis for it? Well, again, in the Garden of Eden, after the first sin of Adam and Eve, God, of course, punished Adam and Eve, but also announced a punishment of the devil, of the serpent, and said that he would put enmity or war, that God would put enmity or war between the devil and the woman Eve, but also between his seed, the devil's seed, and the seed of the woman. And so this was the prophecy that the Messiah, a human child, would be born one day who would bruise or crush the head of Satan. And so what this meant, and of course that's the prophecy, the first prophecy of the Messiah, and so what this did was it set the course of biblical history for the next 6,000 years. Because from that point, the devil knew that his conquest was not going to be lightning from heaven, a legion of angels coming to destroy him. It was going to be a child who would be born, who was from a human woman. And so he, from that point, was set on either preventing the birth of that child or corrupting that child. And so the Nephilim were, and that the incursion by the fallen angels that led to their birth that's what I call the devil's nuclear strike on the human race. By allowing this fornication, this illicit relation to take place, what that was doing was contaminating human genetics. And if the devil could succeed in turning humanity into something other than image bearers of God, then it could disqualify us from salvation by preventing the birth of the Messiah. So this is really the battle that we see throughout Scripture. When you see, even in the, in the days in the Exodus, when Moses was just a baby, uh, we see Pharaoh commanding all the male babies who were of Israel to be thrown into the river, to be killed. You know, in the days of Christ, when Jesus was born at his first advent, again, we see Herod commanding for all the Israelite babies to be executed. So these efforts were, again, the constant battle between these two bloodlines to try and prevent the birth of the Messiah. And as we look to the final Nephilim, what I do is say, let's go back for a moment to Genesis 3.15, because there were two seeds prophesied, the seed of the woman, but also the seed of the serpent. And a lot of what I do in my research is go back to the church fathers, to ancient Jewish writers, to theologians from the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. And the common understanding in the church was that the other seed of Genesis 3.15 would be the Antichrist, the literal seed of the devil and a Nephilim. You know, this is super important as we think about uh, this verse, you know, they, in, in, they call it the Proto-Evangelium, the first nature, the first uh, uh, really mention of the gospel, of, of the good news of Jesus' defeat. But we don't want to go too fast here because really um, 
the challenge is always is let, let's let's for the sake of the audience let's talk about um, the two seeds from a from a biblical interpretation perspective because if we interpret one um, metaphorically or figuratively now all of a sudden within a few phrases we're contradicting ourselves right this isn't good thinking exactly and that's the importance of the small details in scripture when we just let the bible speak and go by the literal interpretation again it's been agreed for for millennia that the seed of the woman is a literal child a literal human jesus christ the messiah and so you know arthur pink one of my favorite theologians on end times prophecy and on the supernatural he wrote, there's only one conclusion that could be reached, that if her seed is a human, the Christ, Jesus, that his seed, the seed of the serpent, must also be an actual being, the Antichrist. Uh, we, we have those that disagree with the Genesis 6 supernatural narrative, and that, that's fine. We love them. They're brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, but on the other hand, there's, it's really hard to, uh, for them to pull back because we do know Luke chapter 3, Jesus is literally a, a son, a child, a physical blood descendant of Eve, right? And to turn it around and say that Satan or the, the, this coming seed of Satan wouldn't be physical is problematic. Now granted, here we are in Genesis 3, three chapters later, he explains that this, this prophecy had a preliminary fulfillment. Just to even give more perspective into how this came about, I talk about in Judgment of the Nephilim that Cain, of course, who was the first son of Adam and Eve, uh, that from the fallen angelic perspective, he could have been the Messiah. After all, he was the seed of the woman. So what do we see the devil do? Immediately, he's corrupted by sin. He uh, makes an offering to God that's not accepted, and then in jealous rage, kills his own brother Abel. And so I call that almost a two-for-one attack by the devil on the bloodline. But when you get to Genesis 6, what you see is God, in his mercy, removed Cain from Eden, and it says, when men began to multiply upon the earth and daughters were born unto them, that sets the stage for Genesis 6. And it was the human population growth that caused the devil to, to have to resort to a large scale attack because now there were many potential messiahs running around the earth. And so this is what led the devil to instigate a rebellion where a small subset of angels, the sons of God, Benaiha Elohim, committed this sin of taking human women as wives, giving birth to Nephilim to, to again, to bring on what I call a nuclear strike to a wide scale attack to corrupt humanity. And when you look at Genesis 6, Time and time again, the testimony is all flesh had corrupted itself to the point that God uh, regretted even creating humanity. And then when you look at the selection of Noah, it says that Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And that term perfect, tamim in Hebrew, refers to physical perfection. It's the same term that's used to refer to a lamb, a sacrificial lamb in, Le in Levitical law. A lamb without blemish is a lamb that's tamim. So rather than referring to Noah's morality, that term is referring to that he was perfectly human. And also being a believer, he was picked and selected to restart, reboot the human race after the flood. I know for me, and, and we have this tendency to um, hold on to maybe tradition sometime. And I, I just encourage you to get the text out and allow it to speak what it is. And, you know, the sons of God are clearly, you know, in Job and other passages, um, they're referenced to angelic beings. Second Peter 2, 4, you reference it in the book. In Jude 6, the same thing. Give us, this, give us this testimony of New Testament interpretation, the angels who sinned. So we have this pattern, and why would we not be surprised to see it continue on throughout history? One of the things that you talk about in here is you, you trace the development of it. Uh, you bring up um, Goliath, you bring up Judas, you talk about um, the bottomless pit, but if you can, talk about the history of the Nephilim as it relates to where we're going. You know, you made a great point that time and time again, the major opposition in the Old Testament against Israel, against God's plans, were the Nephilim. We see them again in the land of Canaan. And of course, we see God commanding them to go and utterly exterminate those seven nations that all descended from Canaan, who I believe was the forefather of the post-Diluvian giants. And so 
they were the major obstacle put there by Satan to try and stop God's plan. And I think, again, when we look at now how, it transla- how it, that transitions to the end times, Jesus Christ made an important proclamation in Matthew 24. He said that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So Jesus told us that if we want to understand the end times and really understand the prophecies of Revelation, we need to look to the days of Noah. And what do we see there? Of course, the Nephilim, I think we'll see a repeat of that, a repetition. And this is a big theme of the final Nephilim, that, what, what, that time, in, from, from the divine perspective, is not linear. God, is, God exists outside of time. And so the events of scripture really repeat. It's more like a scroll where the events are cycling over and over again. And we see this where we, you know, in prophecy, where we call a double fulfillment of prophecy. That we have the Passover lamb that was sacrificed and put on the, the blood was put on the doors to protect the Israelites during the Exodus. And yet when John the Baptist saw Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. The fulfillment of all those lambs that were celebrated at Passover for thousands of years were found in Christ. And so similarly, when we look at the days of Noah, the days of Lot, the Exodus, we see that this battle between these two bloodlines will reemerge in the end times led by the final Nephilim, the Antichrist. When Satan, just, when Satan commits that sin and has his own seed to present to the world as the false messiah and deceiver. And don't be surprised by that because as we look at scripture, we do see this foreshadowing, you know, the theologians will call them types or the anti-type, you know, back and forth. But as you mentioned, you know, we, we think about whether Moses or Joseph, that they're all types of Christ, that, that they foreshadow. Um, we know in, in Colossians 2.16 that all of the feasts and the sacrifices they were a shadow, but they pointed to the substance, which was Christ fulfilling all the sacrifices. I remember talking with a Jewish lady once and um, just said, you know, of all people, she was an unbeliever. I go, you should know this because these sacrifices that are written in the word, every, you know, thousands, millions through 1400 years, all pointed to one thing. And so by the time Jesus would come, you think that they would be like, oh, we got this figured out. I mean, God prepared us for this. And so when you look at these cycles, as you mentioned, um, they're pretty fascinating. One of the things, if you will, um, you, you mentioned the, the similarity of some of these types. Um, you talk about Nimrod and Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar and Sennacherib and the, these, um, these figures as being um, part of the testimony of Scripture that getting to the final. Now, let me talk about that. There are many foreshadows of the Antichrist, just like there are foreshadows and types of Jesus Christ throughout the Bible. And so two, uh, in two different chapters, I focus on first, I think are two clear foreshadows. One is Judas, who I think has some startling uh, revelations about him in Scripture. One, we see just that obviously we know his common story, that he was the, the disciple who betrayed Jesus and uh, was never a believer, was stealing from the treasury of the disciples. But when you look a little deeper, we find out that we see, first of all, how Jesus referred to him. One, he's called the son of perdition, which is a title that's only used for the Antichrist in Scripture in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Additionally, Jesus says a prayer for the disciples. In that prayer, he says that, that he's protected all the 12 except the one who was a devil and, and calls Judas which in, in the Greek, the devil, diabolos, which is only again used for Satan. And then the book of Acts, we find uh, as, they're pick, as the disciples are selecting a new disciple to replace Judas who had died and after committing suicide. And they make a reference to two prophecies in the Psalms that refer to Judas. And one, in one, they say that hell was his own place. Mm-hmm. And so again, we see these mysterious references. And so I point to that. And also, of course, we have uh, Nebuchadnezzar was another example of a foreshadow where we see someone who won who was the king of Babylon. You know, Mystery Babylon will be the end times kingdom of Antichrist. He, uh, in Daniel chapter 2, erects a, a statue to himself, a golden statue, to be worshipped as a god. You know, the Antichrist will sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The statue was... Even the dimensions, 60 cubits high, six cubits wide, and it took six instruments to play to initiate when it was time to worship this king. 
And so, of course, that is a foreshadow of what we see in Revelation 13. The number of the beast, we're told, is 666. And so, you know, it's just amazing when we look that God is showing us that he is giving us all the foreshadows and types to understand end times prophecy. In fact, in Isaiah 46, God, in speaking to Israel, rests his name on prophecy. He says, if you want to understand how I am the true God above the fallen angels, above all creation, it's on prophecy. He says, I have declared the end from the beginning. So that, again, by a literal interpretation, God's telling us if we look to these events, we can understand Revelation just from the types and shadows we see all throughout the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that Ryan does in the book, which I really appreciate, is um, you do make references to um, some really 19th century theologians, but for the most part, you are just getting the scripture out. Uh, you know, theologians will talk about intertextuality. Let's compare scripture with scripture. And talk about that. I, I thought that was really powerful in the way that you presented the material. My goal was to show just how amazing the Bible is that the answers to all the questions we have about scripture, about the end times, they're in, in the Bible. And, and I think God has shown us, you know, the Lord said in, in uh, the book of Hosea that he speaks by similitudes. And so again, it's this idea that God is showing us through types, through pictures that, hey, that we can understand and, and really connect the end times to earlier events in scripture. And so it was really important to me to show that when we go and understand and interpret prophecy, that there's a sound biblical basis for everything that we're examining. So that was the goal behind that. That's, that's super important because you know, our heart here at Prophecy Watchers is uh, not just to become educated, and, uh, but it is to educate ourselves in order to share the gospel and to evangelize. And so we're here to learn, to grow. That's why we provide uh, opportunity to get resources. Um, the goal is to win people to Jesus and to share with them the gospel and the things that are going on in our world today uh, make it relatively easy. Um, I want to go back for a moment what you said, because in thinking in terms of evangelism, um, talk a little bit more about the pop culture connection. Because, you know, I got three daughters. They're all, you know, 25 and under. Um, they've lived on Marvel, you know, their entire life. Talk a little bit about how what you did there in connecting this. What I did was highlight some of the, the books. I mean, there's a large genre of literature. And time and time again, they take the account of Scripture and really twist it to make the Nephilim the heroes, the saviors. And it, they exist in, in both book form and in movies. And another interesting aspect are the movies that actually focus on the romance between angels and young, young teenage women and how it's a forbidden love, where God is forbidding them from being in love. And again, it's making God the villain for preventing a fallen angel from falling in love and, of course, eventually having offspring with a human woman. So it's really sinister what's taking place. And so it's important that we highlight this for the youth. You know, it's so relevant as we look at Scripture. A lot of the, these new series are using the images of really the Greek gods and, and the demigods and all this stuff. It's, it's just amazing how, as we think prophetically, um, how so much of the ancient lore is coming right back and is, is conditioning our, our society, especially the young people, so that when this final Antichrist does come, uh, he most likely, well, he will. We know from Scripture, he will be welcomed with open arms. But 500 pages, I mean, tremendous amount of, of research and comparing Scripture with Scripture, it, it really provides a great, um, a really great foundation for people to look at. So um, in one sense, let's... Let's make a, another transition here. You know, you wrote this book, spent a lot of time on it. What do you want the reader to gain? What do you want them to get out of it? I think that, you know, in understanding these concepts, it, one, gives us more confidence and a better witness because I think it explains the Bible. When we understand the presence of the Nephilim, then the flood makes sense. That the flood wasn't just an angry God trying to destroy humanity. It was God rescuing us and pulling us from the brink of extinction that the wars in Canaan that are called genocides, again, it was God ridding humanity of what could, what could disqualify us from redemption. That time and time again, God is pulling us back and protecting us. And in the final Nephilim, we see that the ultimate victory 
is, is all, it all belongs to Jesus. It's all been declared. And so we can take confidence in our faith and in our gospel witness that God is on the throne. He's controlling everything. And the beauty of prophecy is he's told us everything in advance from the beginning. You know, Genesis 3.15 um, is so important because it is describing a physical seed of the woman who we know ends up being the Lord Jesus Christ through the Messianic line. Um, and I think from a hermeneutics or interpretation perspective, the seed of Satan has to be physical too in order to keep the parallelism there. And we know that Satan himself, he's a spirit. He's not uh, physical in that sense. He can, he can take on physical, physicality if he wants. I mean, there's no doubt the other angels did. If, if we fast forward that, what are we saying? What are you saying here is that Satan comes down like the angels or the, the sons of God of Genesis 6, and he fathers a, a, the Antichrist through a human woman? Correct. That it, it is a repetition. And again, Jesus pointed to that time, to the days of Noah, and said, as it was in the days of Noah, that's what we would see in the years before his second coming. Additionally, Daniel chapter 2, in verse 43, makes a reference specifically that in the end times, the final kingdom before the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. So again, who is the they? I believe it's referring to the angelic realm. So this will be a literal repetition of what we saw in the days of Noah. And something I point to, as shocking as it may seem, I think there's even evidence in Revelation of this, is that there's an interesting series of punishments after Jesus Christ punishes the Antichrist, at the, after the victory of the Battle of Armageddon. The Antichrist and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire, but the devil is not. The devil is put in chains and sent to the bottomless pit. The same exact punishment that Genesis 6, six angels received. They were, the book of Jude and Second Peter chapter two tell us, they were locked in chains under darkness in the abusos, the bottomless pit. And that's precisely what happens to the devil at Armageddon. I believe that's because he has to suffer the same punishment because he committed that same sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or at least instigated it in the beginning, right? You know, and exactly. getting, getting the, his cohorts to do that. Um, as we think about Satan, and you know, he, he has a long history in the Bible, and he, he is the, the chief villain, um, but yet it seems to be, and we don't want to give him too much credit because our focus is on the Lord Jesus himself, but he tries to be like God. He, he, he imitates, and you bring a lot of that out in the book. Talk about how um, Satan and his seed, you know, this final person, are imitators. We see this stated in Isaiah 14, where the devil, and I believe that passage refers to the devil and the Antichrist, that they will, their desire, their chief aim is to be like the Most High, to be like God. So everything Satan is trying to establish is just a demonic imitation of God's work. And so the Antichrist will be presented as a Messiah figure to the world. But, but of course, it'll be the lie, a deception, uh, the delusion, as it's called in Thessalonians. And so... Time and time again, we see this mimicry. And I think when you look at Revelation chapter 13, which chronicles the career of the Antichrist, the passage that really turns the tide of the world seeing the Antichrist as God is when he suffers a deadly wound and is healed. So even the death and resurrection of Christ will be copied to some extent by some dark occult power by the Antichrist. And it's at that point that the testimony of scripture is the world says, who is like the beast? Who can make war with him? That's when he's viewed as invincible, as God, as the Messiah. And of course, this is all a deception. You know, if you, if you read Revelation 13, it's, it's pretty fascinating to see. You have three figures pronounced there. I mean, you have the worship of the dragon, which comes to be similar to what we would call the father. And giving the dragon gives his authority and to to the to the beast, the first beast, which is the antichrist, and then you have the other beast, which is the false prophet. So you have the satanic trinity. It's fascinating to me to see that nothing's new. It is this this uh, mimicking. Yeah, exactly. So scripture beautifully illustrates many attributes of Jesus Christ, but it also gives us insight into the antichrist. Jesus said that he's the way, the truth, the life. The Antichrist is the strong delusion. We're told in scripture about the mystery of godliness was God manifesting in flesh and dwelling among us. The Antichrist is the mystery of iniquity. 
Jesus Christ, when he at his first advent, came from heaven. He said he's the bread from heaven. The Antichrist ascends from the abyss. We're told he's the beast that comes from the abyss. Jesus called himself the good shepherd. The Antichrist in the book of Zechariah is called the idol shepherd, I-D-O-L, as an idolatry, which of course he will be the ultimate idol, false idol of the world. And so time and time again, we see that he is almost a, a satanic mirror image of Jesus Christ. And the scripture outlines this and I go into great detail on this in the final Nephilim. You know, it's, it's fascinating when we see the consistency of Scripture. If you just uh, take the time to do the homework or to read someone who has done the homework, <laughs> it's such a privilege to get the, get the Scripture out and really, for lack of a term, get a concordance out and you know, chasing things down. It's, 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 it's pretty rewarding. It, it's amazing. And, you know, I open in the preface of the book, uh, you know, with, with the scripture that talks about that God, it's, it's the glory of God to conceal a thing. But, but for kings, it's our honor to find them, to seek them out. And that's what God wants us to do, that the Bible is simple and complex at the same time. The gospel is simple. Believe upon Jesus Christ and be saved. But to understand the fulfillment of prophecy, what God's deeper messages are, we have to search. And it brings us closer. And so what I try to do in the final Nephilim is bring out the, the most challenging, complex prophecies and really show by letting scripture interpret scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept, that we can understand things that haven't been discovered in centuries. One, one chapter I have uh, in the book is on the sixth trumpet of Revelation, where we have four angels who are bound in the Euphrates River for a year, a month, a day, and an hour. And so, when I started researching the book, I really wanted to know, well, what is the significance of that time? What does that mean? And I knew that in scripture, we can find a confirmation of what that means. And so what I connect that to was the days of Lot. Jesus said that as it was in the days of Noah, but then said also likewise, as it was in the days of Lot. In Judgment of the Nephilim, I showed that the fifth trumpet, you have these locusts that are unleashed from the abyss and they torment the unsaved world for 150 days. And so for five months, and I connected that to Genesis chapter eight, and that basically that the flood judgment, when the fallen angels were tormented, when their kingdom was destroyed by the flood, it was for 150 days. Then the waters abated and they were dragged down to the abyss to be imprisoned. Well, at the fifth trumpet, they're released for 150 days, and now they torment the unsaving world as a tool of, wrath, of God's wrath. Well. At the sixth trumpet, you have these 400, this 492-day judgment. So what does that connect to? When you look at the genealogy in Genesis, from the flood, our facts that was born two years after the flood, until the day that Jesus, along with two angels, came to see Abraham to tell him about the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah the next day, it's 492 years. So again, from the flood judgment, days of Noah, two days of Lot, we see this parallel at the fifth trumpet and sixth trumpet again. So these, there are so many revelations that are hidden that if we just look and connect the end to the beginning, it all comes together. Let's talk about the, the kind of the question that we led the program with. Uh, a lot of different perspectives out there. And again, um, as always here at Prophecy Watchers, we want to encourage people to Agree to disagree agreeably, right? I mean, Absolutely. I Amen. think of uh, John 13, 35. Um, Jesus didn't say, they'll know you're my disciples by your love of truth and your hatred of your brother, right? I mean, we're, we're to be known by our love for one another. In these, in these essentials, are you saying that this is, if I don't believe this, that I'm going to go to hell? Not at all. Yeah. Not at all. <laughs> I mean, this is, we love getting into the, the secondary and really third level doctrines which is fun, it's exciting, and God's put in there, and it's worth, it's worth um, pursuing. But we also know that good people disagree, and uh, we love them. As long as they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, man, we're, we're on board. Amen. Yeah, so on that note, um, a lot of different, different perspectives on the Antichrist. You know, people will write in, and they'll talk, and they'll ask the question, Jewish or Gentile? What's your, what's your take in, based on your research? I go with Jewish. I believe that the Antichrist will have to present himself as a, as a part of the Messianic lineage in order to be received by Israel. Jesus Christ said, if one comes in his own name, him ye shall receive, pointing to Antichrist. So I believe he has to say, even if it's just a pure deception, that he is a part of the Messianic lineage, that he is an Israelite. Additionally, I point to Ezekiel 21, which I believe has a prophecy of Antichrist that says, O wicked prince of Israel, 
whose end shall come when sin comes to its conclusion. So it's pointing to the end times. I believe it's calling the Antichrist an, an Israelite. And I think that he will, uh, he will encourage uh, mosaic worship that in the first half of his career. He, I believe there'll, there'll be a revival of temple worship in the rebuilt third temple, that there will be Levitical sacrifices, that even when you look in Revelation 17 and 18, many of the goods that go to Mystery Babylon, the, 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 the purple, the scarlet, cinnamon, spices, precious metals, these are all items that were used in the temple and the tabernacle prescribed by God. So I think that's all going to Israel for this revival that will be a deception, that ultimately it's going to lead to the Antichrist deceiving Israel, but he has to present himself as being an Israelite in order to establish this deception. You know, for those that are on the other side, um, you know, they, they'll use Daniel 9, 27 about uh, him needing to be a Roman. Um, what, what's your thoughts on that? How would you answer that question for those that say, well, he needs to be a Roman? Sure, so I look to the end times kingdom as the, the, the feet, actually. So the, the iron and miry clay, I believe that's the actual final kingdom that's described. And I believe that kingdom, the, the iron, is in a fallen angelic kingdom. It's not any nation of, that's a human nation that's referring to fallen angels. And I think this is an important thing to understand, is that when you look at the days of Noah, you had angels openly manifesting with humans. You had God could speak to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Satan appeared, stood next to Adam and Eve when they were all being judged. And of course you had the fallen angels taking human wives in Genesis 6. So the pre-flood world was quite different from the world we live in now. But in the end times, it's going to return. The fallen angels will come from heaven when they are cast out, as we see in Revelation 12, when Satan is, is evicted from heaven by the archangel Michael and his angels after a war in heaven. But they also come from below, from the abyss, just as a repetition of the flood. It's just as the waters came from the, from the fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven. In the end times, we'll have an angelic flood where the angels come from the bottomless pit in Revelation chapter 5. But also they come from heaven. And so I think that final kingdom isn't a nation. It's the fallen angels ruling along the miry clay, which is all of humanity. Well, you know, on that note, uh, this is a great segue for us because... Uh, we talk about a lot of things in our magazine. We talk about Daniel 2.43 and other passages, and we want to give you an opportunity to see how you can get the magazine, which covers a lot of these pretty fun and fascinating topics. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Bob Ulrich, Gary Stearman's partner and the co-founder of Prophecy Watchers. I would love to tell you how you can become a subscriber to our wonderful Prophecy magazine, creatively named The Prophecy Watcher. And ready for this? how you can get eight powerful prophecy DVDs as a free bonus for subscribing today. Every day, the ancient prophecies of the Bible get more and more exciting as we watch world events come into perfect alignment with the words of the ancient prophets. Examine the pre-trib rapture doctrine taught by the Apostle Paul. Come to a deeper understanding of the giants of Genesis 6 and the real reason for the flood of Noah. Read the shocking things we see coming out of the world of science and technology, mind-blowing advances in transhumanism and artificial intelligence. Keep a close eye for a series of wars coming very soon to the Middle East. The Bible's a supernatural book, and we enjoy covering the fringe subjects and dark corners of Scripture as well. UFOs, the Nephilim, the miracles of the Bible, and so much more. It's a one-of-a-kind publication full of articles that will make you a Bible prophecy expert and prepare you for the future. We have a very special subscription offer for you today. For your gift of $50 or more to support the worldwide outreach of Prophecy Watchers, you can subscribe to either the digital version or the print version of our magazine. And here's the best part. In addition to receiving 12 monthly issues of the magazine, this offer comes with a fantastic bonus eight DVDs from some of the leading prophecy experts in the world today. Eight DVDs plus 12 issues of the magazine represents a $200 value, but it's available today for your gift of just $50 or more to support the work of Prophecy Watchers. This offer is available anywhere in the USA and will ship both the magazine and the DVDs absolutely free. Don't wait or hesitate. Call the toll-free number on your screen or visit our online bookstore at prophecywatchers.tv to take advantage of this limited time offer. Looking at the future through the lens of Bible prophecy is the entire focus of this ministry. 
we're motivated like never before by our desire to tell the world that Jesus is the only answer for these troubling times. And we do believe that he's coming back very soon, just as he promised. Partner with us today. Help us take God's message of salvation through Jesus Christ to the whole world. Well, I hope you do get the magazine because, um, as was mentioned before, uh, UFOs is something that we talk about in the magazine as well. So on that note, um, you bring up UFOs in your book and you bring a connection together. And it's pretty important in our modern culture. We're seeing all these reports with the Pentagon and everything. So kind of talk about what you, you mentioned in the book on about UFOs. Right. So again, just following up on what we're just saying about the fact that we're going to have the fallen angels literally manifesting on Earth in the Great Tribulation. I think the UFO phenomenon comes up into how are they going to present themselves? What we do know is that it's going to be a deception. And I don't think they're going to present themselves as horrible beings who want to just destroy everyone. I think they're going to try to deceive, to lure humanity into worshiping them and pointing them to their Messiah, the false Messiah, the Antichrist. And so I think that's where a UFO narrative could come into play, because they could say, We've, we are from another planet, and we seeded the earth 7,000 years ago, we created humanity, we've been observing you, and now we're back to help you evolve into your next level of evolution, to make you you know, Homo sapien 2.0, and we've brought your true Messiah, and they point to the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, you know, we mentioned earlier some of the, the end time Nephilim deception uh, in the QR codes in the video commentary. I did a recent commentary on a, on a recent movie, uh, uh, the latest Marvel movie, The Eternals, mm -hmm. where that's the actual plot of the movie, where these are these uh, e immortal beings who are from another planet who tell him, who've been on Earth guiding the efforts of humanity the scenes, right? and giving technology at, diff at key points to keep humanity evolving. And so and now they return in the end times to rescue them. So I could see a very similar scenario playing out uh, in the Great Tribulation. Sure sounds like uh, the writers were reading the Book of Enoch, I imagine. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at that. Um, you know, as you, as you think about the book, um, talk a little bit, if you will, um, about the hope. I mean, you, you got a lot of details in here, and um, you, right in the beginning, you, you, you shared about really the, the reason that you wrote it. Is, is this meant to scare people? I mean, it's a little bit fringy sometimes. People talk about, oh, you're talking about supernatural, demonic stuff with, with human women and others. What, what do we say to them? We have to take on the whole counsel of Scripture, right? That's what we're told, that we have to understand all of the Bible. And the fact of the matter is, Revelation is God's judgment on the unbelieving world. It's God finally coming in to say, I'm putting an end to all the death, the destruction, the greed, and the sin that we've had for millennia. So, this, so while the judgments themselves are cataclysmic, and quite frankly, they are frightening to a certain extent, there is a message of hope all through Revelation. Because again, the Revelation... What is being revealed is Jesus. It's the time when everything we've hoped for is going to be revealed, when Jesus will openly reveal himself to the world and usher in the messianic kingdom. And so I think the beauty of revelation and the beauty of prophecy is that time and time and time again, God will say, you can know I'm God from my word, from my prophetic word. And so it's how we can have hope that God has been in control of all the events from the beginning. That even when we see destruction, even when we read of the rise of Antichrist, that he's just a tool of God's wrath. He's no opposition. And I think, again, going back to the idea of foreshadowing, I call one of the last chapters in the book, David versus Goliath, battle for heaven and earth, in reference to Armageddon. Because David versus Goliath, you have the messianic lineage in King David against a Nephilim. And that was a true foreshadow of Armageddon. And look how fast it was over. One stone, <laughs> one shot, one stone, and Goliath was over. And I believe that's exactly how the final battle of Armageddon will take place, is that, that it says that in Scripture that by the mere brightness of Jesus, his divine light, by his voice, he'll destroy the Antichrist. So we can take heart and hope that everything we've, wor everything we've longed for for God to do, to bring justice, to bring righteousness, that it's coming. And Revelation explains it. And then we see the beauty of the new heaven and earth, the eternal kingdom, the millennium that God's going to have restore the world to Eden-like conditions, that the, the lifespans will be as they were in the days of Noah, where dying at 100 will be a curse, that people will live hundreds of years, that the, the raptured saints will rule 
alongside Christ until we reach our new heaven and new earth when God will fully manifest. There will be no more evil in the world. So I think that in Revelation, when we get to the end, it's a true story of hope that God, all of God's promises to us are fulfilled, that he will redeem us, he will protect us, he will save us and defend us until we are one with him. As we watch things and the perilous times come upon us in ways that are, you know, certainly new in, in my own uh, Christian experience more than ever, is we do have that constant hope. And that's, that's one of the reasons why we're here is to share the hope of the gospel. I mean, you know, if we die today and you have your faith and trust, then we're going straight to be in the presence of the Lord. But if we are going to be around, you know, as things continue to progress in the sense of watching it develop, I mean, we, we, we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. Uh, it's not escapism. By any means, but we do know in Luke 17 and other passages that, as you mentioned, Lot, it's the days of Noah, it's the days of Lot. It's very similar in that what happened with Lot? He was rescued prior. The angel said, I can't do anything until, you, until you're gone. Um, one of the things that you mentioned a little, a few minutes ago, some people might know, what is a QR code? <laughs> and what does it have to do with your book? <laughs> sure, sure. So uh, the QR, a QR code is a, uh, it's a little kind of illustration, a little, a little square that has, it looks like an illustration, but it's actually a coded message. And what it has to do with the book is throughout the, the final Nephilim, you will find QR codes. And if you, all you simply have to do is open your phone up, go to photo mode, and the phone will recognize the code, and it will take you to video commentary that I provide on different chapters in the book. Bonus content. Exactly, it's all bonus content. So yes, that's what the code is, and you can find it throughout the book. You know, I really hope that you hear uh, Ryan's heart here, that his heart is to reach people. And, you know, this, this, the whole, really, approach that you've taken, it brings up, um, really, it brings all the things that people are interested in into, into our current culture, as well as into understanding the Bible. So we're going to take a break here so you can see how you can get this tremendous resource, and really, all of the resources. The Bible tells us that God destroyed everything that had breath with a worldwide flood. What would cause God to take such a drastic step, destroying his entire creation? We believe it was the event described in Genesis 6, an event designed by Satan to pollute the bloodline of the future Messiah, Jesus Christ. Ryan Peterson has written two detailed books on life in the days of Noah, a trained lawyer and advanced Bible scholar, Ryan has confirmed the biblical account through scripture, historical facts, and archaeology. Both of his books come with corresponding study guides and companion DVDs and are available through our ministry by calling the toll-free number on your screen or visit our online bookstore at pwdaystar.com. Ryan's books study guides, and DVDs are all available individually, but we've added three special bonus DVDs when you order either of the Ryan Peterson packages. When you purchase either the Judgment of the Nephilim Redemption Package or the Final Nephilim Antichrist Package, we're going to send you three bonus DVDs. Judgment of the Nephilim, an hour-long one-on-one interview with Ryan and Gary Stearman, Footsteps of the Nephilim, a deep look into the giants of the Old Testament, and It's All About the Seed, a study on the seed of the woman and the seed of the Antichrist. You won't find teaching like this anywhere else. Each individual $75 package contains the book, the corresponding study guide, and the hour-long DVD documentary, and the three bonus DVDs as our gift to you. As always, we'll ship all six resources to you for free anywhere in the USA with an extra bonus DVD included as our way of saying thank you for supporting the important work of Prophecy Watchers. Is the Antichrist alive today? Will he carry supernatural Nephilim seed, the seed of Satan? Ryan covers this and so much more in these extensive studies, several years in the making. Thanks again for supporting the ministry. As we get closer to the rapture of the church and the tribulation, these materials will wake people up to the lateness of the hour. Tell someone about Jesus today. He's coming soon. Well, we really hope you take advantage of that offer because Ryan has, again, done his homework and given us a lot of information to really consider and ponder. And 
as Ryan mentioned, you know, what, what a tremendous opportunity we have to engage people in interesting topics. Uh, we don't need to be scared of what's going on in the world, especially as we think about our current culture. Everybody's talking about DNA and RMNA, all these other things, mRNA uh, topics. And as we think about scripture, uh, genetics is, is pretty powerful. And you mentioned the, the mark of the beast in the book. Let's talk about that because as we think about our current situation, a lot of people are asking, you know, what is the mark of the beast? Are we seeing it right now? And, and you address it. Talk about that. I think in terms of when we're, how it's going to be presented, I think it will be clear that it will be a choice. So it will be openly presented as, as really taking your, pledging your allegiance to the Antichrist. So we know from Scripture it's going to have an economic component. Nothing can be bought or sold without having the mark. But additionally, in Revelation 14, we're told that if, any, if anyone takes the mark, there's no redemption for them. And I think the reason for that is because there's a genetic aspect that what it's doing is it's again going back to Genesis 6, the days of Noah. It's corrupting human genetics and making you something other than an image bearer of God, which is why you're disqualified from salvation altogether. And another interesting aspect of, that I think is potentially connected to the mark of the beast is this again going back to the fifth trumpet of Revelation because you have this torment of these locusts who are going to torment humanity and it says that men will seek death but it shall flee from them. So for those five months people will not be able to die. And so what I put forward in the final Nephilim is that the Antichrist, just as Jesus Christ says that we are one in him, the Antichrist, after his resurrection, his satanic imitation of the resurrection, I believe will offer that to humanity. So you can be like me. You can overcome death as well. And so part of the mark of the beast will be taking on, mingling with the seed of the beast. And so at the point that humanity finally receives what theologians from centuries ago they called it a physical uh, immortality, a temporary immortality, because this was the old understanding in the church. At that point is when they receive a punishment that makes them all want to die. So I do think that there's a genetic aspect to it, but it will be the worst decision that humanity will make. The final Nephilim. I uh, appreciate you, Ryan, being here. And uh, we covered a lot of material. And as, as Ryan said, you know, the, the hope is in the gospel. And as we think about the coming you know, time of tribulation, God has given us an opportunity, and we don't think that the current situation is the mark of the beast, but we do certainly think that this is a conditioning process as we watch things unfold. So thank you for watching today. Uh, as always, Jesus told us to be watching and to be ready because we know that his return is getting closer and closer each and every day. Thank you for watching, and we will see you next time. Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. You can find us on the web at prophecywatchers.com where you can sign up for our free email newsletter.